Welcome to the Startup Grind. How's everybody doing? Great. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much to Startup Grind for having us. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, this is absolutely my favorite thing to do, is to have a conversation with someone I get to work closely with, and, and hopefully that knowledge helps assist you all in, in pursuing your dreams, your passions, your companies. Um, Derek mentioned the, the Thumbtack billboard, and one thing that is not as well known is that if you actually go on Thumbtack and you try to get your house clean, there is a chance that Marco himself <laughs> will show up <laughs> to clean your house. There's just a chance. More oh. likely if you order a caterer in San Francisco, where I, I have been known to do private chef jobs on Thumbtack in San Francisco. And think the last name in Italian. And uh, so if you want more time with Marco, you know, where to, you know how to get him. So, so yeah, as I was, as I was saying, the, the best part of my job is, is, is working, is building very, very close relationships with founders. And um, at Sequoia, we, we get involved with very, very few companies. It's about one or two per year per partner. There are only six partners, so it's very few companies as a firm. Um, and those, those relationships last you know, at least a decade from a working perspective and hopefully a lifetime uh, in from a personal perspective. Uh, so it's really a cool experience to get up here and share that relationship with you guys. Um, I think the, that uh, Startup Grind was really quite prescient in picking Thumbtack to come speak with everybody because this is, this is a company that is really um, on the cusp of, of breaking out. And over the next 12 months, it's going to be all you hear about. Uh, and it's a fantastic story that involves tons and tons of grit, courage, uh, fortitude, success, scale. Like, I don't, I'll stop with the bu buzzwords, but, but the story is just fantastic. And so we're going we're gonna to have a conversation. I'll ask Marco some questions now. Uh, but I think the, the, what I would ask of the audience is to think about questions that you want to ask. Uh, we'll talk for about a half hour, 40, 40 minutes, but the best questions will come from you all, so please think hard about those and, and um, how Marco and I can, or I can answer those. Um, and I think that's about it. We can kind of dive in. Let's go for it. Um, so I guess, I guess the first, first thing would be, Marco, if one of the things that I think those of us who are close to the company understand that folks outside the company may not have as good of a view on or as much transparency on is just the scale that Thumbtack is operating at today and just how big this company has become in terms of your impact on, on the U.S. and actually outside the U.S. in terms of job creation. But could you just give a, your, your quick overview of, of what the company does and then give us a sense for the scale so people have some perspective um, and then we'll go kind of back in time to, to the founding story. Yeah, so, you know, at this point, and we've been at it for, you know, five plus years, so these numbers are big, but we've worked our way into them. Uh, we now do, on an annualized basis, a billion dollars worth of commerce through the platform. Uh, there's 200,000 unique paying professionals, caterers, contractors, tutors, um, who pay us and are active uh, in any given uh, period. Um, and that's more than Yelp or Angie's is combined. Um, and we've done that without a sales force. And that's sort of probably the thing we're most proud of, that we've gotten to scale without using salespeople, but instead by building a great product experience and a model that in a lot of ways sells itself. Um, you know, in sort of making that impact more tangible, uh, we now clean uh, a house or apartment um, every 30 seconds. So somewhere around the country, there's a thumbtack professional in somebody's home cleaning them every, a different one every 30 seconds. And so the like human impact is pretty immense at this point. And I think the thing that I um, really take a lot of pride in and sort of find very motivating is the stories that come back. Um, so, you know, there's the, the busy mom who sent a picture of her daughter's uh, first year birthday party recently, sort of beaming, showing the kid and the balloon twister and the cake and all the stuff she'd gotten from Thumbtack, you know, saying how proud she was of this great party that she planned uh, with Thumbtack's help. Uh, or the like personal trainer in Maryland who uh, came to the United States as a Bulgarian immigrant with the dream of building a personal training company. I met him recently. 
and he started telling me about how he uh, had this dream, and he spent the first sort of 12, 18 months pounding the pavement, going to gyms, didn't quite work, uh, happened to find Thumbtack, and over the last two and a half years, has now built up a personal training company with 15 trainers, and 95% of his book of business is through us. So knowing that we get to help these customers live their lives more richly, and these professionals build their businesses, um, is really fun. Awesome. So it's tremendous scale, you know, billion dollars of commerce, 200,000 subscribers. I remember at, at Google in the early days when we were celebrating getting to 10,000 advertisers on, on our platform and 50,000, 100,000, and those were really, really big days. And I think it just gives you a sense for the trajectory that this company is on. Um, but I'm really cognizant of, of where you all are at, you know, probably mostly very early stage founders, just getting your company started and, and probably looking to hear more about that. So can you tell us, Marco, when did you decide to, to be a founder? When did you decide to be an entrepreneur? I know you grew up in the Valley, so maybe it was an earlier age than most, but uh, when did it become clear to you that that was your calling? So I, I did grow up around here, and I definitely had that um, sort of uh, visibility I think a lot of people don't have, but uh, it was a very specific experience. So. In college, um, I met my co-founders because, uh, and you'll be surprised to hear this, uh, we had a shared passion for social security reform. And uh, I, I will actually uh, come out and say I think my co-founder was even more passionate about it because he ended up starting a student advocacy group that was involved in the social security debate. And we met through this. I then joined him. We took a semester off of college. And uh, not knowing it at the time or not sort of being cognizant of it, but it was a startup. You know, we built a bunch of software to empower these student organizations to advocate for reform. We hustled and raised a million dollars, signed up 300 chapters, 11,000 students. And despite ultimately not having any tangible effect on the national debate, we still had a very important effect on ourselves where we realized, you know, this was, it's just really fun. Um, it's incredibly motivating to be part of something that's sort of building something out of nothing, you know, rallying people around a shared vision. And just like coming to work every day to like make and build and do, um, it's just fun. And, and we, we caught the bug there uh, and we said, hey, you know what, let's get out of this political arena. Let's go build uh, a real technology company and solve, you know, some problem that we think a lot of customers or sort of humans have. And, and here's where we are. Awesome. And um, how, did, how did you guys pick this space? So... There's probably other people in, the, in this room working on this space, but you know, coming from the venture side of technology, this is a market, local services, local in general, which, which venture firms and startups have been going after for you know, 20 years. And it's enormous. It's hundreds of billions of dollars in terms of market size, crazy kind of eye-rolling numbers. But it's also a market that's just littered with failures and you know brave attempts, but it's been incredibly difficult. And so it's not some kind of obvious new greenfield opportunity. You decide to dive into something that's really, really hard. How did you guys pick this space to go after? Um, so we actually did what you're not supposed to do, uh, which is decide to start a company and then go hunt for the idea. Um, you know. Thankfully, though, we didn't take the approach of saying, you know, what is a problem we have or a passion we have, um, because actually I think that's often bad advice. Um, the, there's a reason, and I hope I don't offend anybody who's working on this category, a lot of travel-focused startups is because founders are atypical in how much they travel, I think. Um, and many of them sort of don't get off the ground because they're not solving sort of a core fundamental problem. In our case, we took the naive, I, I, we got lucky in a lot of ways, um, approach of saying, what's the biggest problem we can solve with the application of technology? And you know, we weren't nuclear physicists, so we constrained ourselves to the world of software, something we knew we could build and deliver. And so we really just started talking about problems, uh, what was broken. And uh, truth be told, Thumbtack is the second idea we came up with. Uh, so the first idea, was in the summer of 2007, was a financial accounts aggregator, a way for you to track your spending, your budgets, your savings. Um, if it sounds a lot like Mint, it's exactly like Mint. Did uh, Mint steal your idea? Uh, or did you steal Mint's idea? Uh, 
<laughs> so like many good ideas, they get arrived at independently by many smart people. And actually, this was really important because Mint launches September 2007 at TechCrunch 50 or whatever it was called then, and they win. They do a great job. And it was like the most crisply bittersweet feeling I'd ever had in an otherwise very charmed uh, life at that point. And so on one hand, we were validated because um, we talked to a bunch of people. Um, you know, I remember telling my brother about our idea, and he's like, well, that's fucking dumb. You know, <laughs> why, why would I ever give you my bank account information? And I know you. Um, and like, look, that's actually like not a bad criticism. I think a lot of people thought that most people would not enter their bank account information online. But those people were wrong, and Mint showed that if you build the right product and create enough value, people will do it. And with that, built a great service. And that was really validating for us because we said, hey, we were right. Uh, the flip side, though, the bitter part was that we weren't going to catch these guys. Um, the, they'd done a great job. They won TechRun 50. They raised their A shortly thereafter, and they were off to the races. Um, I have since met Aaron Patzer, and I have thanked him um, because in the back of my mind, I, I was thinking, man, Thumbtack is such a bigger and better idea. Um, and that only was possible because he launched Mint. Um, and so then we, we went back to the drawing board and went back to this question of like, what's the biggest problem we can solve with technology? And the observation that led to all of Thumbtack was uh, incredibly like banal and almost uh, insignificant. And it was, wait, why is it so hard to hire a plumber? Right? Here you were, 2008. You could buy any product you could think of, and in two days, five days, it'd show up on your doorstep. You could stay in touch with all of your friends from around the world instantly and for free. You could look up any piece of information on any topic, anytime, anywhere, and yet you had to waste a whole afternoon to hire a plumber to then hand them $600 to do something for you. Like, that just made no sense to us. Um, and there was like a long grind. I think the startup grind uh, brand is fantastic because it is a grind. Uh, there was a long grind at Thumbtack, and I think what kept us going was this belief in the inevitability of the idea. That even when we maybe lost faith in some of our tactics or what was going to work for us, we never lost faith that this would happen. That customers are too lazy to expect them in the future to spend four hours on a phone to track down a plumber. And that technology would find a better way, and with that, all of this intent and laziness would flow to it. Um, and you know, it took us years to actually build it and figure out how to do that. But from the beginning, we figured it's bound to get easier. You said, you said something um, earlier in your answer, which was something to the effect of, I had led a charmed life up until that point. <laughs> and I, I think you were probably alluding to some of the incredibly tough times um, that every founder um, inevitably experiences. I think the group here would love to hear about some, of, like pick maybe one or two really hard experiences when you just thought it was going to fall apart or you hit a really hard problem that you didn't know how to solve it and maybe just relate some, some of your learnings from one or two of totally. those. I mean, look, I think the, the hardest part in our life as a business was um, in raising our first round of venture capital. Um, and I think there were a couple of reasons. Uh, the first reason was simply, as Brian was sort of alluding to, the general sentiment of the investor community was that local um, was, they never say impossible, but uh, they find other ways to say no. Um, and that for most people, they had just written it off, and they were uninterested in really digging in and understanding it. Actually, uh, I think Jed is here somewhere who gets credit for leading our Series A and having the foresight of actually believing in this uh, sort of space and ultimately in us. But look, most people were not like Jed, and most people just didn't believe in the space. Um, so that was a headwind we battled. But the truth is, we were also not that good at raising venture capital money. So <clears throat> when we raised our angel round in... Uh, uh, what is it, June 2011, 2010, excuse me, um, all the feedback we got from these angels, and they were sort of very high quality, very prominent angels, was solve the chicken and the egg problem. Figure out how to get supply, how to get demand, and that's, that's all you should focus on. And I think in a lot of ways that was right, just wasn't completely right. And so we worked on that, and we took great pride that over the next year, we built up what we thought was a very robust and scalable way to continue to attract 
customers and professionals. And so here we were sort of June, July of 2011, and we were sort of honestly like a little proud, like chest puffed high, like we'd solved this problem. We were going out and raise money, and we, we picked a super aggressive uh, sort of Series A target, which was to raise 10 million bucks. At the time, that was more aggressive than it sounds today, uh, where people raised. It was, kind of it was like a good kind of two x what a typical round might so have been at that time. Series A's back then were like the four to six. Yeah, now that's a seed round, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> kids these days. Um, <laughs> and so that was partly over exuberance, but that's honestly not the biggest problem. Uh, what we didn't really understand is that every round is a bridge round. And it's a bridge to a set of milestones that some other group of investors will believe is valuable enough to keep funding you. And instead of sort of pointing to that future and understanding what sort of these next investors would need, we were looking backwards. We kept saying, hey, look at all the great things we've done. Um, now we're at this sort of next stage. And one of the things that we've sort of underestimated was how much people were interested in seeing um, sort of unit economics. And at the time, at the very start of our raise in the summer of, of 2011, we hadn't invested in that. And that was in part because of the advice of our angels and in part because of our sort of ignorance to how hard it would be that we would sort of, we sort of blindly said, oh, we'll take care of that later. Um, and so the, the feedback started coming in. And you know, when you talk to these investors, they, they like to believe they give you uh, straight answers as to why they say no. The truth is, they give you all sorts of answers, most of which are meaningless. They're just trying to be nice and get you out of their office. Um, I, I'll give Sequoia credit, which uh, gave us the feedback right then and there saying, hey guys, love your approach, love the market, but we haven't seen a business model that we believe in. And so at that point, we kind of had to scramble. Um, we knew we could do it. And so in this fall of 2011, we sort of paused fundraising and put in place a business model. It was a subscription-based business model, one that we knew wasn't perfect, but we knew we could get in place very quickly. And these are one of the things where, you know, they always tell you like invest for the long term, you know, do things that are right, not that, you know, not that are just sort of uh, needed today. But there's times where cash is running out, and you have to just do things that are short-term focused. And this was one of those times, and we put in place a business model that we knew was fundamentally imperfect, but it did enough to prove to investors, you know, Jed among them, that we could make money, um, that there was a way to extract dollars out. Um, and that, you know, in a lot of ways saved the company, that sort of month or two scramble to build this subscription model, which we later totally gutted and threw away. Um, about 12 months later, uh, we switched to a whole new model after a year of testing um, to get to where we are today. Uh, but that was a really trying experience. Uh, it's trying because, uh, you lose faith in yourself, right? When you have a bunch of smart investors tell you, no, I'm not gonna invest any money in you, it's very easy to sort of say, well, maybe I'm not investable. And that doesn't feel good. In fact, uh, I lost 15 pounds in the uh, fall of 2011, sort of in raising or trying to raise that round. Um, and eating is something I really enjoy doing. And so this was very notable for me. Um, and then the other thing is, team starts to lose faith, right? In each other, in the vision, in their leadership. How do you hold, this is actually my next question. When, when, when things get that tough, and you, you guys have been, you and Jonathan have been so transparent with how, and how you run your company. I'm sure the team at that stage knew you were raising and they've seen the pitch and yep. they're getting daily updates from you guys. And how many people here are founders or future founders? Pretty much everyone, right? So like for what, what advice do you have for the group here? Because I'm sure that someone in here will h hit upon hard times during a fundraise or trying to hit a milestone or a competitor launches. How the heck do you hold together that team during that time? So look, if you hire good people, um, you should presume that you can't trick them. That they're gonna see right through your sort of smiles and you're like, oh no, it's gonna work out and they're gonna read your body language and they'll sort of take note of the fact that it's been 10 meetings and there's still no next meeting. Um, so I think I learned a lot about how to be a better leader and uh, what I learned was uh, you just have to be very vulnerable and it's scary, right? It's scary to admit, 
hey, I don't know why we're not able to sort of make these guys interested. I wish I did so I could fix it, but the truth is I don't know. Um, and that's, that's hard and scary to say. Um, but what's actually even worse is when people think you're not aware of the problem, so you're an idiot, or you're not confronting it, so you're a coward, or you don't know how to deal with it, so like, why should we even be here? So, I mean, basically, as hard as it is to sort of come out and say, um, I'm failing at this, or this is not going well, or we need to change direction, um, not doing those things turns out to be harder. And so one of the things I've learned is like, when I'm scared of something, it's usually a good signal that it's worth doing, um, which really sucks, because the things that you're scared of, you don't want to do. Um, but that's uh, a powerful lesson. And, and as a team, you sort of ask sort of how we stayed together. Um, so I remember once we were sort of past the hump, and we got a couple term sheets, found a great partner, raised the round. But then we had a really like come to Jesus moment. We're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We have to drink some beer and like talk about what just went down and be really honest with each other about what, what you did that was great and what you did that was awful and what sort of you need to do in the future such that we don't have these types of problems again. And so it was uh, a really trying experience. You know, I think the phrase like, um, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I don't know if that's always true because I haven't tested it. But in this one case, it was, it was for sure true. And we grew much stronger as a team. And really what happened is um, we created a real partnership. And that sort of forged the DNA of the company. I mean, to give you perspective, by the end, uh, seven out of eight people weren't taking a salary. So it was not like fun and games at that point. It was like running on fumes and trying to stretch all the dollars until we could make it work. And then, you know, we did and we were happy and have sort of sort of grown very nicely since then, but it was scary. Yeah, I, I think it's it's absolutely true that, you know, there's 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 no to me greater sign of a, a truly great leader than fearless transparency with your team. Um even when it's that kind of a message. And I'm, I'm sure that's what held them together. So I think everyone in Silicon Valley talks about how, especially VCs, we're looking for these geometric growth curves for business. Be it a, if you're a consumer business, you want to see a geometric growth for users. And if you're a B2B company, you want to see that for revenue. What's not talked about as much is the fact that as a founder and CEO of the company, because you also started here, you're going to have to actually grow geometrically as a leader. And there aren't really other contexts in business um, or necessarily even in life, even if you think about a professional athlete started in you know, high school and then kind of worked their way up, where you actually have to grow and lead a team, but you have to grow at a geometric rate to keep up with the entity that you're trying to lead and manage. Like, are, do you have any tips for the audience on what's, I mean, you've done a phenomenal job in, in your growth and leadership of this company in the, even the two and a half years we've been working together. It's, it's awesome to see. Like, what are, what are your secrets? Um, so, I think there's You can't say just raw, innate talent. <laughs> <laughs> so, the first answer was to stay humble. So, I was definitely can't say that. I mean, so, uh, uh, the, the, the truth is, I think uh, the worst mistake you can make is presuming to know what you don't actually know, because uh, that's really dangerous. And so I think the approach of basically saying, uh, I'm an idiot know-nothing who is in a very lucky and fortunate position is a good starting point, um, because at least for me, that's very uh, terrifying and therefore motivating. And honestly, the, like, the fear factor is uh, not wanting to be the, what holds our organization back. I never want to be the bottleneck. I never want to be the limiting factor because that's unfair to all the great people that we have at the company. And so part of that is fear. But the flip side of that is like, uh, like so much excitement and thankfulness that I get to go learn and like uh, grow in so many different ways. And I have a pretty simple approach to what I spend my time on. It in, and it's what matters most to the business. What's existential today? If you think about your business, there's probably one thing that if you don't fix, you're fucked. Um, and everything else doesn't actually matter. Um, and it's not the same thing, and it changes over time. You know, at first for us, it was very, it was all about like product market fit. It's about business model development. It's about raising money. Now it's really about recruiting and hiring and sort of helping sort of integrate these sort of VPs and leaders that we're bringing in, um, building sort of culture and communication sort of things at scale. Uh, so like 
the step one is figuring out what you should actually be working on because like the blessing and the curse of a startup is like you could effectively work on anything uh, or there's a huge surface area of problems to solve but most of them uh, don't won't actually change your trajectory or they won't sort of get you past the existential risk of, of dying so you have to first identify um, what is most important then I think the second thing is you have to take advantage of uh, what makes Silicon Valley so great, which is that people are immensely open um, and they are so willing and generous with their time and their learnings. And actually, think this is what's so helpful about having uh, great board members that you get to go to Brian and say, hey, Brian, um, I have never hired a VP of HR before. I'd love to go meet four great HR leaders. And help introduce me, help set up those meetings. And those people are always so willing, um, part because they like Brian, and part because they're just nice, uh, to share, right? And, and you just have to have a, a very aggressive sort of learning orientation to suck down content from um, all the smart, helpful people that are around the valley. And there's a special place here, right? Because it's not a zero-sum game, right? For you to run a startup and be super successful, unless we're direct competitors, has almost no bearing on my success. And so if you come to me asking for help, I'd be happy to give it to you, knowing that in the future you might help me with something else. And that sort of like positive sum dynamics creates a lot of like helpfulness and sort of sharing, which is really special. You don't see that in a lot of places. So I think it's like figuring out what is uh, existentially threatening your business uh, and then trying to learn as much as possible about it, but never pretend that you actually know what you're doing such that you stay humble and stay nimble. Who in the room, it, your next round is a seed round, and then I'll ask the next round is an A round. So who's the next round is a seed round? Okay, who's the next round is an A round? Okay, actually, is like a B round coming too? B? Just it, lo it looks part, like part, I'm not going to try to invest in your company, don't worry. Um, so the, uh, what I was going to ask you, Marco, is if you were going to go back in time and and raise a seed round based on kind of what you know today, like what would your game plan be? So, um, so I think uh, the I'll work backwards from the A. Mm -hmm. So I think the thing that we didn't appreciate, and certainly what has become even more true today, is that your Series A is your first growth round, and that means that you have to have a repeatable process. You have to be solving a real problem. You have to show that people appreciate your solution, and you have to have um, sort of unit revenue, unit economics that are interesting and a credible path for how to continue to scale it. Now, the specific uh, sort of uh, area of business that you're in, be it sort of consumer enterprise, changes that dynamics a lot. But uh, the, what they don't often say is that there's actually not that much venture in venture capital. Um, that they want, they like their their favorite investment is when there's no risk, right? That's that's the dream. That's uh, the dream. That's sure. the dream. <laughs> and so they want you to have done as much as possible. And I think for a Series A, because the like explosion of startups has meant there's so much more supply, Series A investors are getting pickier and pickier. And what that means is you have to have proved more and taking more risk out of the business, such that the risk is not product market fit. It's not whether there's a business model, it's growth and execution risk. Can you actually take this sort of uh, nascent working unit and stack a lot of units up to build something big and build something meaningful? Um, I didn't realize that was how you raise a 10 to $12 million Series A. There's still the traditional Series A, you know, the three to five, um, but that is, uh, you know, when you get sort of the eight to 12, 10 to 12, it's about having, it's your first growth round. So I think for the seed round, um, basically, it, it depends on who you are and where you come from. But at the end of the day, uh, from what I have observed, people are ma mainly backing sort of how competent they think you are, just like generally. Are you smart? Do you hustle? Do you make uh, interesting comments? Do you have good answers to my questions? And then what you've built. like. You've presumably built something. Like, how credible is that? Is it solving a real problem? So it's you and your product. Um, I think that's from my, I, I know less about the sort of seed stage because I'm very far removed from it at this point, but that's from sort of what I've observed. I don't know if you have mm -hmm. different view on that. No, I think it's exactly right. I think that today there is an abundant supply of seed capital, and there are probably a bunch of people in here right now, based on the hands, who are thinking about the Series A 
and the bar has definitely been raised for the Series A over the last few years. And part of the reason for that is you can build a company um, in a much more capital efficient manner, which means f that for the companies that have executed the best, there is real data. And I don't know, th I, it would be nice to take a ri make a riskless investment. I would do those all day long by definition. But we are definitely trying to like calculate the risk associated with an investment. Uh, and so the reason it's okay that the round sizes for Series A's have grown from five when I think you were trying to, when you were raising your A to 10 now is because risk, risk adjusted, given the data that we have, we can actually make a better investment decision on a per dollar basis. So it, it is really important to have that data. Now, what I would say though is what matters less is the scale of the data and what matters more is the quality of the data. So you hear a lot of people talk about unit economics or really wanting to understand retention or if you're a B2B company, customer references and how efficient you're selling. So we don't necessarily need you to be a huge company for a Series A, um, but we want to see that you're executing really, really well on a unit basis. And, um, and I'll, just, I'll just mention also that at Sequoia, we focus on, at least from the early stage perspective, which is where I spend my time, um, we focus on seed and Series A investments, so this is pretty relevant to to what we do. Uh, Marco, in the in the last year, I think you have gone with with Thumbtack. You and Jonathan have gone from zero VPs to having staffed an entire management team of VPs, both by promoting from within and hiring executives from the outside. Uh, I think that's a record-breaking pace, and I would say that you've done that without lowering the bar. You have a fabulous executive team. How have you succeeded on that in terms of putting together a team so quickly? Um, so uh, I think there, there's sort of the setup and then the execution. I think we actually, in a lot of ways, waited a long time. So September of last year, so September of 14, we were five years into building this business, and we had no sort of VPs, effectively. Uh, we had uh, just the start of more senior folks coming in, but by and large, that, that team sort of that summer was still folks uh, like me, sort of pretty young, uh, first job, second job, third job out of college, um, really hungry, but pretty green in a lot of ways. And I think uh, we got lucky by waiting, by sort of being able to go far without bringing these folks on, we put ourselves in a position to go out and get the very best folks because we had a platform that was interesting and meaningful and exciting for them to come and contribute. Because you know, if the thing you have to keep in mind is, you know, the opportunity cost of your first job out of college is big, but the opportunity cost of your like second to last job before you retire, your third to last job, is way bigger. Um, and especially for these folks who know that it's hard to find uh, you know positions that are a good fit that pay the right pr like pay the right amount to support their families and are close enough and all this sort of stuff um, is is tough so uh, they are as picky or pickier particularly the very best ones uh, as you are um, so that's sort of the setup um, the thing that we had learned uh, before uh, really hiring any of these folks. We just learned it by making mistakes, which was you have to be very clear about what you're looking for. Um, ben Horowitz actually has a good uh, blog post, I believe, or maybe it's in his book, where he talks about um, forcing yourself to pick two or max three things that you want the person you're hiring to be awesome for. Because it's very easy to craft a laundry list of things that you want this person to be awesome at, but the truth is nobody's awesome at a dozen things. We'd like to believe we are, but we're not. Um, and if you make that the criteria, you're going to find someone who's mediocre or just uh, above the bar in all of those, but not truly exceptional. And so what we found is, first off, we have to force ourselves to understand what are the two or max three skills that we want this person to be world class at. Then we have to go actually and see what that looks like. What is world class. And this is so, so Brian and Jed and other people who introduce us to all the great sort of leaders here in the Valley for us to sort of learn and absorb these lessons. So you see what they look like and they smell like and they talk like and they act like. Because you need some, some sort of like pattern matching. You need to actually know what a good answer is. And that just takes trial and error. So I, I, I remember telling my wife, uh, she'd be like, so, you know, what'd you do today? And I was like, honestly, I went on a bunch of dates. 
I was just like, is, is not, it, don't be threatened, but like, I just professionally dated all day. Um, I would have, you know, two coffees and a lunch and somebody would come by the office and we would just like chat. Um, and obviously we we're trying to find out if we were going to get like professionally together. Um, but it's very similar, right? You're trying to like get a rapport and get a feel and then ask these hard questions and see how they react. And it's like just super time intensive. Uh, it's a total grind. And the frustrating part is that you often know like it's hard to know if this is the right person, but you can all of a sudden very quickly know if it's the wrong person. And you know, out of respect, but also out of like respect for the for them, for the process, and also because you just can't be an asshole, like you can't just like walk away. And so you drove down to Palo Alto because you're so excited because this person had an awesome resume. You sit down and ten minutes in you're like, nope, never gonna happen. Um, and so it just eats enormous hours of your day. Uh, but that discipline uh, is super important. And then I think uh, what's key is uh, developing an interview plan that actually assesses for those skills such that you can create a framework uh, and get buy-in for this person. It's really scary to bring in a leader. I mean, for all of us who are sort of like young and excited by the positions we had, like bringing in, um, you know, uh, a woman who's late in her career, a man who's late in career, who has a lot of experience, has, has a lot of authority, is exciting, but it's also terrifying, because like, what if they just change our jobs or change the culture or generally do things that we think are dumb, like they can fire us, we can't fire them, and so it's, it's super scary. So by creating a framework that A, defines what you're looking for, and B, establishes how you're gonna evaluate, and bringing a bunch of people in you can have like a rigorous conversation around, okay, so the skill number one was a technical competence of all the related you know, X's and Y's that are relevant to their job. Did they demonstrate that in these two interviews? Yeah, actually they crushed it. Here's how I looked at it. Here's how they did. Okay, great, on to the next skill. And like through that, you can get people more confident because you, know, you get over the fear of, uh, is this person right? It's like, well, to the best of our ability, we think they crushed the interview, so let's go out and, and go get them. And uh, as painful as it was, you say no to most people. Um, we, uh, I mean, I, our, our VP of engineering, we're looking for starting, I think it was like January, February, March of 2014, and we hired him in uh, January of 2015. Um, and the like bittersweet part is we only made one offer. He accepted it but obviously he was the last person I had met basically. And so you gotta have a lot of patience and a lot of um, confidence to some degree that, that that person is out there to, to keep the bar high, to keep looking. What, l last, and this is just a quick question, what, what percent of your time have you spent on recruiting in the last, over the last year? Just if you had to guess. I mean, it's, uh, so between, uh, there's like three steps. There's getting people into the process, mm -hmm. There's evaluating them as part of the process, and then there's selling them once they're through the process, like a two thirds, yeah. half to two thirds, something like that. I mean, when I say like I, I tell my wife today I professionally dated, like there are days where all I've done is talk to potential candidates, interview people, and then go on a cell chat in the afternoon. Awesome, thanks, Marco. Uh, let's turn over to the audience. Love to hear any questions that you have for Marco or me.